Joining me in the GB News pub tonight for Talking Pines is Telegraph columnist and author Tim Stanley. Tim, welcome to Thank Talking you. Pines. Mm. You are prolific in your columns, and you talk about the new yeah. pet dog you've got, but you talk about, you know, big political issues, and, you know, from Kent, educated in Kent, not very far away from me. The fascinating bit is that you were a Labour candidate in That's 2005. Right. So how long did this sort of left-wing phase last? Well, I have to say, first of all, the last time you and I met was at a Boxing Day hunt in It Kent. was, it was. So that shows how you, far to the right I've moved. <laughs> the horror. <laughs> it was oh, just although, research. Although, actually, actually, there's nothing right with a left wing, is there, about... about oh, not at all. And that's what I discovered while I was there. It's an expression of countryside identity, which I didn't appreciate. And the dogs are gorgeous and terrifying. Was that the first time you'd been to one? First time I've ever been to one. And, and people wow. bring their ordinary dogs along. And it's like when you go on a beach and there's this muscle-bound guy... And you're this skinny little pigeon shepherd. That's, that's what a German shepherd looks, lo looks like next to a, a proper uh, foxhound. And they're beautiful, aren't they? They are And the great dogs. thing about the hunt meets, that one that we've been going to, is the bar opens at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> On Boxing Day. Yeah, yeah it's pretty it's when you need it. It's, it's pretty when you need it. Uh, anyway, I, I, yes, I, uh, I was a radical. I was very left-wing. In fact, I'd call myself a Marxist. I was on the left oh, of the Labour Party. So well, even though, I, even though my uh, meteoric uh, rise and fall was under Tony Blair, really, I disliked him. I was a Benite. Uh, I regarded yes. myself almost as an entryist in the Labour Party. This was the vehicle for socialism. Uh, and uh, and I, I really loved it, and I, I have no regrets whatsoever. But ben was consistent, wasn't he? Ben was consistent, and he disliked the EU and as well. And principled. And that's one of the things that attracted me to that group of people. They had sort of lost the argument because the Cold War was over, but if there had been a revolution coming, I would have joined it. So I was pretty much on the left of the Labour Party. And Mr Corbyn, was he a friend of yours? I met him once, but he was always slightly on the outskirts because he was really a foreign policy buff, which is one of the... It's a bit surprising that what he ended Palestine up getting... Palestine issue. It was about Palestine. Really, John McDonnell was the big hope of the hard left and the Labour Party, but he just chose not to run that one time, and that turned out to be the one time that it worked. Had I stayed in the Labour Party on that trajectory, I would have been a Corbynite. So you stood in the general election? I stood in the general election of 2005 in your for the Labour Party. In in my home constituency of 7, 8 in Kent. <laughs> As a radical leftist. And I came third, but very narrowly third. And the contest in 7, 8 is always for second place. No one cares about first. We're left wing. No one wants to win. <laughs> the joy is coming second with dignity, and I didn't. Uh, but I tell you what, uh, in 2005, uh, I was wet behind the ears, innocent. Uh, I thought everyone loved Labour. And it was when I actually... <laughs> campaign properly in the working class part of Seven Oaks, which is mm. Swanley, the mm. northern part, part of the town. Yeah. For the first time in my life, uh, people said to me, immigration, immigration, immigration. And this not only surprised me, but it slightly wounded me as an innocent middle class left winger, because I thought, I'm left wing, I want open borders, I assume you want open borders, Don't we, are we all good internationalists here? And I discovered they were really worried about immigration. And when I went back to the Labour Party, I took the view that you need to address this. And they became the UKIP voters. And they became the not... in Swanley became the UKIP Actually, voters. some of them became BNP voters, and Swanley became, I think, the first place south of the they Thames win a seat, to they? elect I a BNP councillor. I, I remember that. So you can take the view on the left, you can say, we're not going to deal with those issues, you racist pe we're not going to have... We're not gonna, or you can take the view, look, our people are hurting, they're worried about something, let's address it. So getting out and canvassing, knocking on doors, campaigning... And by the way, I love it. Mm. And it restores your faith in humanity because oh, yes. most people are actually really very, very nice. You know? Yes. You're on their doorsteps, you're on their terms. Yeah. But they are very nice and it does restore your faith a bit in, in, in people and society. And was that the beginning of your, of your political change then? It's never one thing and it's so tempting to draw yeah. a narrative. It's yeah. lots of different things. It's because I became religious. It's because I started paying tax. Uh, it's because I had more to do with America and I, I fell a lover, in love a bit with America. I, I left under Ed Miliband. And I think that was because the party faced a choice. It could either elect David Miliband, which was Blair Mark II, yep. but was a serious shot at government, oh. or sod it, let's elect Diane Abbott or someone like that and go properly left-wing and offer people socialism. I can't imagine what the, what the finances would have been. <laughs> and instead they, they went for Ed, and I think that was the moment which I thought, they're neither principled nor serious about government, mm. and I want to go away and do journalism. So that was when I severed my connection with the Labour Party, and since then, just like a dinghy on the ocean, I've been drifting further and further away from them. And now a leader writer on the Daily Telegraph. That's right, yes. Which is the Tory graph, as it's known. <laughs> um, which has been, by the way, done very well with subscriptions. And you, you've had a good, it is, it's doing fantastic. You've had a very good couple of years, I think. Yeah, it did very well out of Brexit, yes. So how would you describe yourself now? 
I would describe myself as a small C conservative, a traditionalist, sometimes red Tory, sometimes Christian socialist. It's impossible to nail me down. Tory anarchist is probably somewhere in between the two of those things. I don't really know. And let's analyse. I mean, I've been talking tonight about Boris Johnson, talking yeah. about the 2019 manifesto. OK, we know Brexit done was the big top line. 64 pages, one page, talking about a net carbon commitment for 2050. Right. Now it's obsessive. It's everywhere. Um, it's potentially quite dangerous, I think, that Rudy's taking us down. That's just my view. But, I mean, tell me something. You must sit there at the Telegraph... Mm looking to write the leaders with a group... I, and I you know, know most of the people involved, and they are basically conservatives. They, they believe in conservative principles. Is Boris Johnson a conservative? Yeah, I think he is. Do you? But he's, he's a big-C conservative, not a small-C conservative. So it's all about the party. There is, there is an, a, a philosoph philosophical tradition, which is conservatism, then there's the Conservative Party, which is a beast which changes its clothes every few, every few generations or so. And which Boris himself out. has done in his career. That, that's what he's done too. And what part of the problem with uh, the Conservative Party is that its instinct is to preserve whatever status quo it inherits. So when the country turned towards New Labour, what did it do? It became a Blairite party. It ape it. And then when the country voted for Brexit, they adopted the Brexit issue. But at the same time, they're still trying to keep that middle-class progressivism going. And that, I think, is articulated through the green stuff. I'm personally pro-green, I have to say. I, I disagree with some people there. But what I find frustrating... Well, pro, we're all pro-green. Right. But what we're not pro, what I'm not pro is much of what's been done in the name of going right, right. Namely, taxing... And you should get this as an old socialist, taxing the poor and giving the money to the rich. Oh, I, I'd entirely agree with that. But what frustrates me about Boris's approach is he's not honest about where the technology is and he's not honest about the cost of it. So at this conference today, I had to watch that summit speech. There was a remarkable bit in which he admitted uh, that wind production had been down a bit because wind hadn't been blowing. And he said, get this... No, but he said this. He actually said this in front of an audience of international billionaires. He said... <laughs> Perhaps we need to propitiate the god of the winds and sacrifice a goat. <laughs> and Bill Gates burst out laughing. He also said at what, one point... What, what have they put in this? The Prime Minister also said at one point uh, that offshore wind farms were a cash cow. And he turned to Bill Gates and said, isn't that true? And Bill Gates just sort of smiled... Uh, an empty smile. <laughs> the tech isn't there yet. It costs a lot of so money. Why does he believe in all this? Or, or does he believe in it? I mean, what... <laughs> I think, I, I think there's a genuine conservative commitment there to ecology and the environment. I think it's the people he's surrounded by. Um, and I, I, th this is his mission. Come on, it's Carrie and the Goldsmiths. <laughs> it? It's the Richmond Green Party, isn't it? Yeah, but there they are. You can see even you know, the rewilding. Yeah. You can see where these agendas come from. He's been persuaded that this is going to happen and Britain should be the best in the world at it. And one thing I'll say for Boris, he's a patriot. He wants his country to lead. If, if the world is going off a precipice, he wants Britain going off that precipice first. <laughs> <laughs> With a great big union, Jack. A fab. Parachute. Yeah. Chief <laughs> Levy. You know, wonderful. <laughs> Tim, you've written a book. Yeah. Um, whatever happened to tradition, history, belonging, and the future of the West. And this, this subject, the future of the West, is something that I'm very exercised by. I'm really worried about the virus, mm. Marxism. It keeps mutating and coming back once every few years in a different form. And everything I see with BLM, with identity politics, it's all designed not to bring us together, but actually to divide us uh, and to sort of bring down the end of Western civilization, Christianity. I mean, everything our society mm -hmm. has been built on. That's how I see this. Uh, but tell me, what are you trying to do with this book? I, th I, I think what you describe is part of the Western tradition. This is the problem, this is the pickle that the West is in, that much of its tradition, especially since the 18th century, is about constantly self-analysing and deconstructing. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of a, it's a, it's a Western paradox that we have these definite values and traditions, but we're constantly deconstructing them. And right now we are in the process of deconstructing our history. Um, and the pro part of the problem with that is that if you, you can't agree upon a past, it's very difficult to imagine the future. You need these things. You need these reassuring things. I argue that tradition is not so something that's attractive. It's not just uh, Sunday roasts and cathedrals. It's also useful. 
It plugs us into a community. It gives us a common language. We can understand things and process things together. And it also connects us to our past so that someone described it as being like a slender handrail. It's something as we go through change, tradition doesn't stop change, uh, but as we go through change, yeah. you, can just, you can guide yourself along. And the problem with this constant deconstruction of our history is that we lose those traditions and thus we find it much harder to cope with change. And I think that can eventually lead to anarchy. And on the point about Christianity, mm. you know, we are a Christian country, we have a Christian constitution, we have an established church. Um, yeah, we'll come to that in a sec. Uh, with the Queen at the head of it. Um, I, I know that you're a Roman Catholic. Yeah. And quite big news, isn't it, this week, really, that Michael Nazarelli, who was the yes. Bishop of Rochester, not too far from us, in fact, both within the Diocese of Rochester, where we grew up, um, and somebody that confirmed one of my children and uh, that I've known a bit over the years and really respected and thought you know, it's important the Church of England has someone like this. Mm. He's left um, and joined uh, the Catholic Church. And I, and I can understand why. Anne Whittacombe, former colleague of mine, had made that journey some years before. Is the failure of the Church of England to actually stand for anything, is that part of our decline? Yeah, I think it is. I think the tragedy is that while traditions remain strong, institutions become weak. That's the centre of it. It's not, it's not the tradition of Christianity, because that contains certain eternal truths that many people believe in and bring uh, courage and peace to their life. It's the institution itself. And one interesting phenomenon with the West is that, to borrow a horror movie cliché, uh, the call often comes from inside the house. It's actually people inside the institutions who undermine the institutions. Mm. There's, there's a last man standing mentality, an idea that there's something noble in winding things down, that you, you shouldn't be too overconfident or bullish this, about your institution. Wasn't this the foreign, the, the foreign office's right. view? Right, whole approach yeah. to Britain. <laughs> managed, managed to climb, and that yes, was one that's of the exactly. reasons they love the European yes. project. They thought it would replace empire yeah. somehow and, that we, and they deluded themselves yeah. that we'd have a senior position. And I, I, I must confess, what, I, what really riles me about it is it's so elitish and, elitist and snobbish and it means you don't pass anything on. It's basically saying, I'm enjoying this thing. I'm enjoying the dress up. I'm enjoying the privilege and, and all the wealth mm. and prestige that mm. comes with it. But I'm so sophisticated that I recognise its faults and I'm happy to let it go. Well, that's fine. But what happens to your kids and your grandkids? See, tradition's not just about thinking about the past. It's about passing on a heritage. It's, tradition is almost a verb. It's about passing things down. And we've reached a point where it feels like some people be quite happy to let things go, let the churches go, let yeah, the No, no, I agree go. with you. I agree with and you. And it's, uh, it's yeah. so frustrating. It's, it's almost this sort of self-loathing, isn't it? It's, yes. I mean, I mean, Orwell wrote about this. Yeah. You know, going back to the sort of middle, late 1940s, he wrote about, what was the, the quote about, you know, that the, the, the middle upper class Englishman would rather steal from the poor box on a Sunday morning than stand for the national anthem. I mean, <laughs> it was that kind of thing that Orwell yes. was talking about. Yeah. And it was interesting in the Brexit debates, you know, in the 20 something years that I spent in the European Parliament, there was that certain type of Brit, nearly always English actually. And the attitude was, oh, they do things so much better over here. You know, we're right. so awful, we're so ghastly. I mean, we're yeah. just dreadful, you know. It was all that negativity. But sticking on religion, mm -hmm. What happened last Friday down in Leon C? Yeah. Sir David Amos, a very old fashioned member of parliament in a way, had the things that he believed in, stood up for them, people respected that. An old fashioned MP, not there to climb the greasy pole, been there nearly 40 years, uh, brutally, brutally killed. I've been stunned, Tim, stunned for the narrative, most of it for the first 48 hours, mm -hmm. that this is all because of rancour and that politicians must come together mm. and be more consensual. It's all rubbish, isn't it? Politicians have always torn chunks out of each other. I feel some sympathy for them, I'm afraid. As someone particularly who works in Westminster okay, and some of these on. MPs over time become your friend, that's the context. I mean, I, I, there are two separate issues here. One is the context... Uh, to their emotional and psychological response. Many MPs are frightened they could be next. They feel I exposed. That. I know that. And they also feel that they, they do, a, a, they do a, the job the best they can. They're there to try to do good, like Marc Francois said in, in Parliament, no left-wing shrieking violence was, by any means. He was here last night. Right, yeah. darn good speech. And they feel they have to take a lot of nonsense. And so that's the context. But as for why he died, I, personally, I feel it's not unreasonable to wait before commenting. But there's an well, the police have of, already told us. Right, but there's also an element of 
many people detect an element of hypocrisy because when Joe Cox was murdered, mm. people were very quick to comment on why it had happened. Sadiq Khan being one of them. Right. Now, I, I, I'm one of those people who feels you should hold back and wait and see because I don't like overreaction. I'm that kind of conservative. I don't... Normally, Tim, I'd agree with you. But right. In, in this case, we know that the, the suspect, the main suspect, I think that's the legal language we have to use. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The main suspect was put on a prevent programme that... Was referred to. Referred to it and didn't seem to go anywhere. We know that the police <clears throat> are investigating right. an Islamist terrorist yeah. murder and nobody wants to call it out. No, that's true. And, and in that debate in Parliament, it, well, sorry, it wasn't a debate, but in the tributes given in Parliament, uh, there was a lot of talk about, as you say, hate towards MPs, but not about that. Um, and Unbelievable. I think we all know that had this been a different kind of killing for a different kind of motive, we'd be talking about that. Endlessly. Uh, Joe Cox's death was blamed by some people almost instantly upon Brexit and leave. And, 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 and I, I, I remember it vividly. And, what it, and, and, hey, that death was incredibly tragic. And when it happened, it changed my whole attitude towards politics. I thought after that, I thought, I've got to be nicer. I've been too, I've been too cruel and cynical. I've got to be nicer. At the same time that death did not change the outcome of the referendum, not because the British public are hard-hearted, but because they can see the distinction between a crazed individual and an, an entirely legitimate political yes. cause. In the same way, by yes. the way, that people can see a distinction between a crazed individual and Islam, the two things are completely different and shouldn't be confused in people's minds. Tim Stanley, final question. Can we save Western civilization? Of course we can. It's been through this many times before. It always tends to... One of the great things about it is its capacity for reinvention. This is a very positive book. It can be done, and it will be done.